most of the time when I do these courses, they're done um, as a project of uh, the Bionutrient Food Association. Um, this case is not, this is an independent endeavor, but um, that is the organization that I am the executive director of. We are a, a nonprofit educational organization. I think we're seven or eight years old now. Um, our uh, agenda is increasing quality in the food supply, by which we're referring to flavor and aroma and nutritive value. I think I talked about that at the beginning. Um, we have annual conferences every year, um, uh, all of which have been recorded, and the um, audio at least is downloadable and available for people to, if they've got things they're bored doing and want to listen to an MP3. We've got all kinds of really interesting, cutting edge people uh, presenting different topics. You can download that off the website. Um, we have uh, <coughs> local chapters, and I think it's 16 different states now, um, uh, which are basically self-organized by people oftentimes following a course. A couple people will say, this is very intriguing and I want to look, look more into this. And, uh, you know, a few people say we want to, you know, keep, we want to work on this together. So they get together and have potlucks every month and, you know, have a meeting at somebody else's farm and, and you know, maybe some sort of a, of a content um, piece. Um, we have uh, put together uh, mineral depots, which is basically um, we've tried to find a lot of the critical uh, minerals, the trace elements, the inoculants, the foliar sprays, um, get them, go to the quarry, get them at their, at their real price, you know, charge 10% for logistics and make them available to our local chapters so people can get their hands on a lot of the stuff that otherwise would be quite difficult to find in your local areas. Um, um, this is a, a, a project of the local chapters. It's not like you as one person can call up from North Carolina and say, I would like two pounds of cobalt and no. We're <laughs> if you as a local chapter want to put together an order, we can hook you guys up and send a couple pallets down and it can be offloaded in somebody's barn. It's a, it's a collaborative endeavor. So we're at that level of function right now with the process. We basically have been doing this work of, of training growers in principles of biological systems ever since our evolution, ever since our, our foundation. Um, I've been talking about the idea that um, a consumer would have the ability to test quality at point of purchase as a driver to help uh, facilitate this broader series of, um, of shifts that we're talking about. Um, the basic concept is, you know, literally something the size of your smartphone with a little camera that can go boop, boop, flash a light, crap, boop, boop, crap, boop, boop, decent, and you can choose the best, you know, quality bag of carrots off the shelf um, based on its nutritional reading, not based on its label as organic or local or whatever. Um, so that's an idea we've been talking about for a long time um, <clears throat> as, you know, you know, can you imagine what would happen if consumers were choosing food based on its quality? Then the buyers would be telling the growers that they will buy the stuff that's the most nutritious. Then the growers will start managing their soils in manners that are actually growing high quality crops. Then we'll stop needing fungicides and insecticides. Then we'll stop using fertilizers. Then we'll be sequestering carbon. Then agribusiness won't have any money. Then they won't be able to write the farm bill. Then humans will actually be eating food that's nutritious, so they'll be healed, so then they won't be needing pharmaceuticals in the medical device industry. Then the federal government won't be being bankrupted by healthcare. <laughs> then people will be more coherent, so they'll be able to tune into their higher natures. So we'll have a culture that actually is functionally... <laughs> so anyway, that's been the vision we've been talking about for years, is let's use rudimentary self-interest. Your children are getting sicker and sicker, and the doctors aren't helping them and you know we can help you choose the food that actually tastes like food so the children will eat it and uh, will heal them. That's been an idea is that we can meet people where they're at as a visceral personal self-interest not greater goods carbon sequestration that's all a nice part of the story but the real thing is um, your kids are sick and they're not getting better and the quality of your food is a major piece of the puzzle. So. Um, so <clears throat> finally, we are taking that project on of working on that. I've been talking about it for years, uh, waiting for the time to seem like it was ready. Uh, as of last year, I came across some people that actually had the sensors and were able to manufacture these things at the price point of like $100. Um, um, there's, already, there's a company right now called Sayo that's already putting a chip into a smartphone. Um, it's not sophisticated enough, but the idea is that version 2.0 or 3.0 would be an app. So you wouldn't need a special gizmo. You could just literally use your smartphone and go, boop, boop, 24 out of 100, boop, boop, 36 out of 100, boop, boop, 80 out of 100. Um, when I talked to Whole Foods about this like six years ago, they said, not a chance in hell we're going to help you. But when you're two years out from having it, please come tell us.
because we'll tell all of our growers that they have two years to meet standard. Um, my idea is that, you know, the, sy the system is not going to make it happen, but if we make it happen, the system will, will rapidly, you know, um, get on board. So this is my idea about how we can use enlightened self-interest to facilitate the kind of transition we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> part of that process would also be a definition of what is quality because we don't actually have a definition right now. And also more importantly, I think more importantly, but maybe not more importantly, a database where we can identify environmental conditions and we can say to growers, look, you, these are the environmental conditions in your farm right now. Based on other farms we've looked at, the thought is that this is probably your limiting factor. So we're going to make, make recommendations to you based on your, based on your conditions. You know, you need two grams of cobalt per acre in a foliar spray and this inoculant. And that'll address this biochemical imbalance, which will give you resistance to this infestation, et cetera. So a big, broad, open source, transparent data set, um, you know, engaged by growers and research institutions, et cetera, to identify what are the causal factors in crop quality and then what are the effects? What are the causal factors in carbon sequestration? What are the, you know, monitoring all that, tracking all that, doing it in a totally transparent and open manner. So, um, yeah, so organizationally, we are basically doing courses like this and conferences and mineral depots and chapters, and we're now adding this next layer of broader organizational endeavor um, to the mix. That's why I don't have time to write a book. <laughs> Traveling the country, trying to get all these famous people to sign on to the project so I can get the money donated, so I can actually do the job, so I can, yeah, anyways. <clears throat> yeah, the technology that you got the, te the technology is there, right? I mean, the technology is there. The spectroscopy is there. It's, it's, I mean, this is, anybody heard of Alpha Centauri? Alpha Centauri? Yes, that one? Yeah. It's eight light years away or six light years away or something. If you ask any astrophysicist, they'll tell you with great confidence exactly what Alpha Centauri is made up of. Right, Alpha Centauri, it's 51% hydrogen, 48% helium, 1% other gases, and these levels and ratios. Right? Where's the farthest spaceship we've sent out away from the planet? Not that far. At the edge of the solar system. Okay. Oh. Voyager 2 has made it to the edge of the solar system, which is by no means a light, you know, week, much less light years away. So we've never sent anything there, and yet we feel great confidence with what it's made up of, because there's this thing with chemistry and physics where everything in chemistry is a vibration in physics. The light coming off of Alpha Centauri, hydrogen vibrates at a certain frequency and helium vibrates at a certain frequency. If you look at the light really closely, you can tell what it's made up of based on the light that comes out of it. So that's what a spectrometer is doing. You flash a light at the carrot and you read the light that bounces back and you can read the chemistry. You can read the, bio, you know, the, 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 the compounds, the elements in the carrot based on the light. And so we're now at a point where the um, sensors are, you know, small enough and cheap enough to be put into a, a gizmo that a consumer could purchase at something like 150 bucks. And we weren't there five years ago. We weren't there five years ago. What's that? I mean, it would help us as farmers buy one of those, like somebody that buys a Briggs meter. So the, farmers would the, farm, the idea is anybody who wants to can check and see what's going on and we can learn together. We, we, we do this in a totally open source, transparent manner. It's not proprietary, it's not controlled by anybody. This database is in the commons. And, and, and the more people who engage in it, the more we learn, the more we can support each other. And it can be applied on big 10,000 acre farms. It can be applied on you know, 200 square foot gardens. The principles apply. And so um, that's the idea is we can use this understanding, this deeper integrated multi-factor understanding to support growers everywhere on the planet. I'm, my people are the small holders in the developing world. That's my, if, what I'm, if I'm making decisions that are not supporting them, I change my decisions. I don't really care about North Americans. We are so privileged, it's not even funny. Once you've been to other parts of the world and you've seen what it's actually like for most people, hopefully that'll change your priorities. So for me, when I was working in India as part of the global anti-GMO campaign and documenting farmer suicides in the villages, I was like, what are we doing here? These people are starving to death because the land is wearing out. How do we give them the tools to revitalize the land? How do we, what's the strategy? How do we actually get to a point where we can systemically empower the smallholders 
to revitalize culture on the land where it belongs, not in the frickin' stupid cities. Just saying. Anyway, so that's the vision of the organization. It's the strategy of the organization is to fil facilitate these larger objectives. And we think that there's an alliance, an overt alliance between the global warming activists and the, and the you know, people concerned about the aquifers and the ecosystem and the farmers and the sustainable ag people and the people interested in uh, food systems and school lunches and nutritionists. We actually all have the same incent agenda. Our proposal is the quality of the food links all of that. So let's figure out what quality is. Let's give the people the ability to test quality. Let's identify what the causal factors are in quality and do it totally transparently and then just let the collaboration occur. We don't need to fight GMOs. We don't need to fight agribusiness. We don't need to fight pharmaceuticals. We don't need to fight anything. We build the solution. We make our own little sandbox. And anybody who wants to come play in the sandbox can come play. Let's figure out what actually is quality. Let's figure out what causes it honestly, transparently, and collaboratively, and then see what happens. So. <clears throat> Do you have a time frame on the <coughs> gizmo as you go? Uh, I am trying to raise money to make it happen. Um, so right now, the organization, uh, with all of our national activities, uh, I think last year ran on a quarter million dollars. All of our staff, all of our travel, all the conferences, everything was a quarter million dollars, which is... You haven't forewarned uh, Whole Foods yet, quite yet. Um, I've got a plan that I've been putting together. We rolled out the vision. I mean, we, we, agreed, we agreed to do this project in August. As an organization, we said, okay, the time is ready to do this now. And then we spent all fall putting together the team with the software people who have the platform already built, the people with the gizmos that are sensors in the fields that you can plug into the automatic blah, blah, blah. The people that have already built the handheld sensors with the machine learning algorithms, open source, here's the code. We, we brought together that whole team of people who already have these skills, because we don't have those skills, and laid it out at our conference and said to the organization, do you think this is a good idea? And the organization said, yeah, go for it. And so we spent the last two and a half months, three months, whatever it's been, writing up the documents and then starting to shop them around and say, look, we need between seven and $10 million over the next three to five year range to do these three things, to define quality, to build the gizmo and calibrate it, and to build out the database and begin to populate it. So I've been running around the country, you know, basically getting famous people and connected people to say, yes, this makes sense. And they've been sort of making introductions to their friends that have money and we're gonna be putting together a crowdfunding campaign and going public with all this stuff. We've been keeping it basically below the radar and you know, only through you know, face to face conversations talking about it. And so now we're, uh, I mean, this is my last trip. I've been on the road since the beginning of January, basically maybe two weeks at home in between, speaking all over the country, making meetings and organizing and stuff like that. I am on, I go home on Monday. This is my last stop. And we go and we start to push out the social media campaign and the crowdfunding campaign, follow up on all the leads, you know, get the, the executive summary so signed. And we could get involved, <coughs> say, in South Carolina or whatever it is. You, we, we can you can start a local chapter. Local chapters yeah, if you've got friends that are well, you know, financed or even not well financed, do you want to give us a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks? Um, you know, the idea is that if we fund this thing broadly, if the people fund it, I mean, $10 million to do something like this is peanuts. It's peanuts, right? You, 10 miles a road costs $10 million. Like, we can have the pieces in place to transform this planet with that kind of money. The idea is if we can put together the, you know, we haven't been engaging in social media. We, we're like, I don't have a social, right. <laughs> I got way too much going on in my life to have a Facebook account. You know, I mean, I, so we have, been, we have been actively not engaging the world except through word of mouth. And so now we're ready to go public and say, so we got our plan, we got our pieces together. Now we're ready to do something. Who wants to help out? And we think we have enough friends and allies that this will, will actually raise the money. And then the answer to your question is, it'll cost, it'll take six months to build the tool. What kind of prototypes in six months? I need $2 million to calibrate, to define quality. So I get that, I get two and a half million dollars right now. You know, by the end of this growing season, we can have beta tools out, which are calibrated, which growers can use by this fall to test your, test your crops, if I get that money soon. If it takes, you know, six months to get the money, then it'll be next year. But it's, we're, you know, in the realm of, like, months, not years. 
basically right now, depending on how much money comes in. So, yeah, that's where we're at. All right, that's the organization. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I'd like to just give people a quick update. Any questions on that? Is there a local chapter here already? Uh, no. There has not been a, a course in North Carolina. So, so generally, at a course, one or two people who are the kind of people who are like doers show up and say, I'd like to start a local chapter. I'm like, you're the one I was waiting for. <laughs> so you said something about wanting to start a local chapter. Potentially. So I have a quick question, though, and this is not me trying to, it's more, it's not me trying to be the devil's advocate. It's just a natural kind of logical thought is that if you, if you provide the means to expose a, salute, a, a problem mm -hmm. without, you know, the masses being affected, having solutions. So it's almost as if this tool will provide the end consumer with the ability to essentially um, diagnose or, or illuminate an issue, right? Low, yeah. low food quality. Whereas the mass is growing. I mean, there's a handful of people that actually are dealing with like teaching people really sustainable tools and, and techniques needed in order to remineralize the soil, in order to grow good food. And so yeah. like it almost seems like for an organization like this, it would almost have, I guess you have to pick and choose your battles, but it's like you're, you're choosing the battle of creating the ability to sh expose the problem. Whereas the question is, who's going to provide the, the means for the solution? So what we've been doing for the past eight years is teaching courses about how to do this and developing relationships with consultants who are working on a global scale on tens if not hundreds of millions of acres. There are big companies like Dole and, you know, I mean like big companies that are applying these practices because it makes them more money, right? I mean, there are millions of acres in the Midwest where corn and soy and pasture ground is, and grain crops are being managed biologically because it simply makes better economic sense. There, I mean, there are- but Those are like two, gen you know what I'm saying? Like there's a handful of people in that space very, very small. The transition is occurring. The data is out there. At what point, I mean, the idea is with the, with the database, I wanted to do the database first. I want to do the database, which figures out what it, you know, how do you cause quality first. And the problem is who's going to give you money for that? So we start with $50,000 to expose carrots and milk and tomatoes and eggs. And we, if in, with $50,000, we get enough samples from across the country to expose the spectrum of variation and say, hey guys, did you know what the variation in quality in your food is? What? No. Did you know that we could build a tool so you could check? Really? So this is like, a, it's a covert op to get the database which figures out what causes quality, which is a real question, which is a multi-factor analysis conversation. And I've been asking people who know better for, for years you know, what are the real answers? And no one knows because we haven't been able to study it because it's a too big of a problem. Anybody who studied this has, done, has studied it proprietarily and is not sharing the information. We need to do this in an open manner. And the question is, how do we, how do we leverage it? So if you want to give me $5 million to build a database first, I am happy to build a database first. I just thought it'd be easier to get 50,000 first and then 500,000 and then 5 million. Um, it's like it's the farmers that are going to meet that need. It's building the need by having the awareness. What's going to happen when the tool comes out is that there's going to be variation. And, you know, and you're, going to, you're going to sit somewhere in the variation. What I think is going to happen is as farmers start to do a better job, what was a 50 this year will be a 30 three years from now. Right? That standard is going to, is going to move. It's going to modulate based on what's available. And as, we are, as there's a, a, a rush to the top, then there's going to be a pressure for everybody to keep improving their, their process. And people who are doing a decent job right now, you know, it'll be a while until conventional ag catches up to you. But when they do catch up, watch out because they're systematic about it. They're, they're business-like about it. They're, you know, I was just driving through the Central Valley in California the day before yesterday. You know, they, you know, <laughs> they, run, they run business. They don't, they don't screw around. So if they, if they choose to focus on increasing quality, I think they can actually do a pretty good job. Um, They'll never be able to do as good a job as a, as a polyculture environment. They will always, you know, if you pick stuff raw, it'll never be as nutritious as if you pick it ripe. So there's going to be always an incentive built in for people who are local and people who are doing, a, you know, a more of an integrated 
practices, I think. But I don't know. The science will tell us. This is an original research question, right? All the research that's been done is the single factor analysis stuff. What happens if you take calcium out of this equation? No one's looked at the microbiome and the soil type and the environmental conditions and the epigenetics and, the, and you know, look at all these pieces together and sort of tease out the connections. So um, I'm seeing some people have serious looks on their faces. It's like they're <laughs> working in all kinds of different places and directions. <laughs> if I could only hear it, I can almost hear some of you. <laughs> How does this correlate with uh, like John Kempf and his uh, organization with the Agro Eco? Uh, John and I have been um, thick as thieves for 10 years, uh, talking this out, planning this out. It was at his kitchen table when we decided to make this happen okay. in August. I mean, he takes a different approach. He's into it from the business side. So if he, he can show people difference. how to make, make money and at the same time increase the quality of the crop. I went to the nonprofit educational side. He went to the, you know, you know um, consultants, products side. But we took the, our first courses together 10 years ago at, at Acres. Um, we were, I mean, he was 18, I was 28, or whatever. Um, but we were right there learning together and, um, yeah. So we have allies who are doing serious, I mean, that, that what's exciting is, you know, we're a podunk operation, but we've got some famous people who think what we're up to is a good idea. And so if we can just leverage all their, you know, reputations and, and networks, all of a sudden it's this amazing community. So it's kind of exciting, all the people that are showing up. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you too? You're famous. You support us also? I knew it was a good idea, but Jesus, this is starting to get legit. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's, what's good nutrition worth to you? You know, it's like, it's your health, it's your life. It's your consciousness, it's your children's health, it's your, it's the, it's the, it's the land, it's the ecosystem. Yeah. I want to move forward, but yes. The foliar analysis is of spectrometry. Mm -hmm. So you apply spectrometry to humans. So what, what's wrong with your plant based on the spectrometry of the level of your leaves? Yeah. So instead of sending your leaves into a lab, you... Right. What happened to that? I, I think it was NPK. I don't think it was anything sophisticated. I think they were predicated... The assumptions of what quality is, or what was right and wrong, was based on nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. It was conventional agronomy. It wasn't actually looking at more sophisticated biochemistry. I don't know. If you can show me the link, we can talk about it. And I can study what they've been doing. So my neighbors who are scientists said it would be a calibration problem. That, you know, they're actual plant geneticists and they, I think they do this stuff. So I have a million dollar equipment rate. instead of handle hundred, $200 things. So. That's what we're getting to is, is I mean, that, the team that we're working with um, out of Michigan State built a little handheld spectrometer that it was a, it's called the photosync that they, you know, bring into the field and you, you know, put it into the leaf and you flash a light and you get the readings and you can, so it's, what you're talking about might be the adaptation of that. It's all spectroscopy. The question is what's your algorithms and what's your, you know, foundational assumptions about things. Um, if you think that it's NP and K is all you need for the plant to grow and that's your calibration of the, of the tool, that's, you know, a totally different world than where we're coming from. Our first question is, what is quality? What is quality? What is the spectrum of variation of nutrients and crops? What are the correlations to flavor and aroma and health-giving attribute? And then once we have that understanding of what quality is, then we can begin to track backward to what the causal factors are in the environmental conditions. So they're, they're assuming a set of like, we know the answer to what a healthy leaf should be. And I'm saying we, we don't know. We don't know what quality is. And until we know what quality is, we can't figure out what the environmental conditions are that are correlated with it. So. It's a more of, a, of an open, you know, whatever, science conversation. I do want to move forward just because we've spent time on this topic and I don't have a lot of time left today, um, if that's okay. I'm happy to talk more with people during the break if they'd like about this or other things. Uh, inoculation is my next slide. I talked about this uh, in short um, this morning in the, first, in the first section. I think I referred to um, colostrum and colicky babies and all that stuff. I'm sure you remember it. I think I also said this is, uh, inoculation is the uh, least expensive, most powerful, uh, simplest thing that I'm going to recommend in this two-day course. Um, and I'll, I'll repeat that. Of all the things, as I understand it, of all the things you can do, best bang for your buck, lowest hanging fruit, least money, least time, biggest effect, um, inoculation is it. 
Um, establishing good gut flora at birth is a foundational piece of the puzzle. I use the metaphor of, of colicky babies and, and, and colostrum to, to convey that point. Um, uh, it's a really simple process. Um, I'll explain it right now as far as it would pertain to something you'd buy in a jar and then tomorrow I'll go into the process of how, how you can make your own inoculants, harvest your own inoculants from the ecosystem. You don't need to buy them but some people do. Um, uh, anybody who's ever bought a bean and pea inoculant uh, to put on their legumes to facilitate nitrogen fixation, this, that's the idea. Is you're just taking, you're buying an inoculant to put on your seeds and the only difference is you want an inoculant that has at least 50 different families of bacteria and fungi a much broader spectrum of species um, that are from different communities that are known to be critical symbiotes in our crop plants. Um, the Azotobacter and Rhizobacter are two species that are, uh, work with legumes to fix nitrogen. So you just want a broader spectrum, that's it. And so you're looking for products that have that broader spectrum. Um, you know, one ounce of inoculant may be good for 50 pounds of seed, might cost you $5. Anybody know about spores and the shelf life of spores? They can ride meteorites from solar system to solar system and still be viable. You know about spores? They could make it better through a nuclear holocaust than, you know, uh, cockroaches. One ounce, 50 pounds of seed, five bucks. Really not a big effort. Right? You guys could probably all buy one ounce together and share it, <laughs> and that would be enough, unless you've got some serious farmers here, right? Maybe a couple of serious farmers. You need two ounces of inoculant. Um, you don't need that much. It's really powerful. Um, you literally open the seed packet, open the inoculant packet, and just take a pinch and put it in every seed packet. Close the seed packet, shake it up, and those spores are on the surface of the seeds. It's no more complicated than that. You can make it more complicated if you want. Um, but just ensuring the broad spectrum of species present um, in the ecosystem when the germination process occurs, uh, in, my, in my mind, is a really foundationally important process. So there's some that you can recommend, I mean, as far as what you could purchase uh, to, that, that has a broad spectrum? I generally don't ever use the names of companies or products when I'm talking on principle. Um, but if you come up and talk to me on the side, I will talk to you. <laughs> um, Yeah, I'd like to not be uh, confused for a salesman. Um, so um, I can make that real easy by never ever naming a product. <laughs> That's really a good way to be not confused for a salesman. Um, we have lined up some pretty good um, products that are part of the Mineral Depot for the organization, um, but I can happily tell you some, some companies for sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, but then again, tomorrow I'm going to tell you how to make your own. Uh, you're obliged to go for a walk. But other than that, um, you know, it's, yeah, <laughs> so cheap I bother, <laughs> or both. <laughs> you can buy them and then you have to go for a walk, get some, get some local ones too. Yeah, uh, either way, either way, I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's like so simple. I'm not sure what else there is to say about it. Do anybody have any questions? Specifically with mycorrhiza, we yeah. got one in particular. Is that something that you spend money on? Uh, I generally have, my inoculants have a spectrum of bacteria and fungi, and mycorrhizae is one of them. Yeah, there's four basic families of fungi. There's, you know, who knows how many families of bacteria. Uh, microbiologists have tracked a lot of the stuff out. They've tracked out what are, the, what are the key families that are critical symbiotes with our crop plants. Um, and a lot of products will be one, one, one species. And even with that one species, you'll see dramatically positive effect. So the idea here basically is just get a broader spectrum of species. Um, um, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Good on inoculation. We can go to seed before lunch, and then we will actually be totally fine on time for stopping at 3.30. Um, All right. So we go from one of the um, easiest to address, uh, least expensive, um, most powerful pieces of the puzzle to one of the most complicated to address um, um, pieces of the puzzle. Um, seed quality, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, a, a really important aspect that I don't hear many people talking about. Um, people have heard of this idea uh, of the health of the mother affecting the health of the baby. Mm -hmm. Heard about that one? Yeah? No? <laughs> it's been said. <laughs> There's a connection between 
the health of the mother and the health of the baby, and even the health of the grandmother and the health of the baby. The eggs, the mother's eggs are, you know, it's like, it's generational, right? These things track through generations. Epigenetics is a term um, that's used to refer to how environmental conditions affect genetic expression. Um, um, people may or may not know about the seed industry in the organic community um, and organic regulations. And if you're a certified organic farmer and you can get your hands on organic seed for a certain cultivar, then you have to buy it. But um, it's generally more expensive. And luckily for the organic farmers, most seeds not available in the organic vari varieties because there are no organic farmers that know how that are growing the seed growers that can produce this cultivar without it being eaten alive by a flesh-eating fungus, right? Um, it's like saying if all the women in France were unable to, you know, complete the gestation process without getting cancer, then you'd say that all the French women were sick. If there's no seed grower that can grow organic bolero carrots without the plants being eaten alive by Phytophthora, that means the genetics, the vigor, the health of the mother plants is quite weak. The only way that the seed, you're able to get the seed is by spraying these toxic chemicals to keep the diseases at bay. That's the, that's the health, that's the vigor of our seed supply right now. Right? The seed quality is a massive piece of the puzzle and um, it's, it's, it's really, really important. Um, I was, when I first started to put all these pieces together in my head, because I never heard anybody talking about this, I'm like, wait, shouldn't, isn't seed, what? I, I think seeds, why, who's, everybody's talking about the genetics, like this variety versus that variety. No one's talking about the health of that genetics. Um, so I was make, started making phone calls, started calling up seed companies and calling up the Organic Seed Alliance and various people I thought knew what they're talking about. Um, I ended up talking to a guy named John Navazio who helped actually found the Organic Seed Alliance and Oscara, I think, and he's now working at Johnny's, but he's had, you know, had a 20 year career in the industry, in the seed industry. Um, and I was starting to ask him about this question about seed quality. He's like, yeah, yeah, they screen it. Um, so what happens in industry, which I never heard, was um, he gave me the example, I think it was Thai spinach. There's uh, two growers in Oregon that grow all the seed for the planet for Thai spinach. When they grow the seed and harvest it, they send it to the company that owns, that owns the variety. And that company puts the Thai through a series of what's called screens. There's a 12 screen, which is a big holes. Any seed which is too big to fit through a 12 screen gets sold to their buddies in the Salinas Valley that plant 50 acres at a time. That's the best stuff. Then they put it through a 10 screen. Any seed that's too big to fit through a 10 screen gets sold to the farmers in New York State that plant 50 pounds of seed at a time. That's decent. Then they put it through an 8 screen. Anything that's too big to fit through an 8 screen will germinate and that gets sold to what's called the packet trade. The packet trade is every single company that sells seed packets. There's two farmers on the planet that grow all the seed for the variety. The best stuff is sorted out before it's sold to the packet trade, which then packages it and sells it to us. We are getting the runts of the litter by definition every generation. Anybody ever grown dill and saved the dill seed and seen the size of the dill seed? And like you didn't plant it all, so you got some of the seed packet. And you're like, well, how come this, my seed is three times larger than the seed I planted? Ever had that experience? Because one generation of decent environmental conditions has a dramatically positive effect. They were doing this with pigs, I think, in the, in, um, I think it was Iowa State, where they took um, the prize winning sow from the Iowa State Fair and they said, what's the effect of good genetic, on good genetics of bad nutrition? And um, so they took the prize winning sow. This is the sexiest pig we can get our hands on. Um, and they started feeding her poorly. And by the time they got down to her grand piglets, they had downer pigs. They had pigs that couldn't stand up without breaking their legs. It took two generations to wear out the genetics. They said, okay, great. Two generations, you can wear them out. No problem, good, we got the answer. Now they took those grand piglets and said, now what's the effect of good nutrition on bad genetics? And it took them two generations to get back to the prize winning conformity. 
This is epigenetics. This is how environmental conditions affect genetic expression. I would say that we, as a civilization, as a species, are two or three generations into bad nutrition. And we can thoroughly expect the degenerative diseases to increase and continue to increase as long as we don't improve the quality of nutrition. Right? We're getting to a point now where people can't reproduce. Right? I mean, children are getting major epidemic. We don't even need to talk about it. Right? It's just most people have doctors. Right? You only have a doctor if you're sick. Is there any reason to go to a doctor if you're not sick? I would suggest there might not be. Most people are on pharmaceuticals. The majority of you know, Americans are on pharmaceuticals for a disease. That's the sign of something being wrong in the species. Um, so anyway, I digress. The, the point is, the quality of the seed is a really big piece of the puzzle. And as long as you keep buying seed every year that is, you know, has multiple generations of poor environmental conditions, all the rest of the good management practices you do you're only ever going to get up to 50% of potential. You're going to start off with, with plants that are foundationally weak. And until you give them a couple generations of good environmental conditions to begin to fix their genetic markers, you're never going to be able to get to where you want to until you start growing plants that have had healthy mothers. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm not aware of any seed company that is focusing on the health of the mother plants, that is focusing on the foundational vigor of the mother plants as the defining factor. I'm not, and that's unfortunate, um, but it is what it is. What I've been doing more and more is saving my own seed, and it's really not that complicated of a process for many crops. I grow a lot of salad greens. I spend a lot of money on salad green seeds. Um, my salad green seed that I save always kicks the butt of what I buy, categorically. I did this experiment a couple years ago where I take, well, so we'll just make it practical for people. So there's a couple things you can do. If you're going to buy seed until you saved your own, um, you know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. This is, this is a, a real democracy here. Um, I would say, so I, I did this experiment. I, I was looking for, um, I think it was Astro Arugula, and I said, um, I called up high mowing. I said, hi mowing, I'm looking for Astro Arugula. What's the test weight on the seed you've got right now? They're like, well, we'll tell you the germination rate. Like, I don't want the germination rate, because whether it germinates in two days or germinates in 14 days, you give me the same number. And stuff that germinates in two days has a hell of a lot better vigor than the stuff that, that germinates in 14 days. I want to know the test weight. How many seeds per pound? Click, 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 300,000. Thank you very much. Hung up. I called Johnny's. I said, Johnny's, I'm looking for Astro Arugula. What's the test weight in the seed you've got? You want the germination rate? No, I don't want the germination rate. I want the test weight. <laughs> click, 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 250,000 seeds per pound. Thank you very much. Hang up. Call Fedco, Fedco, I'm looking for Astro Arugula, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 275,000 seeds per pound. Thank you very much. Hang up. Who did I call back an order from? Johnny's. The fewer seeds per pound means the bigger seed. The, the more germ, the better vigor. Um, I was talking to somebody at Johnny's about all this stuff when I was making my phone calls around, and he was telling me a story about, um, about Bolero carrots, and he said, Sometimes we have bolero carrots that are 100,000 seeds per pound. Sometimes we have 800,000 seeds per pound. I said, you're going to tell me that? Do you know? What? So, oh, but they all germinate. I'm like, who here has started tomato plants? Anybody start tomato plants? You see some tomato plants that, that germinate on day five or six, and some, most of them germinate on day 12 or 14. There's a couple that come up, and then the rest of them come up. I would suggest if you took the seeds before you started them and you found the fat ones and you planted them here and the flat ones and planted them there, you would see a beautiful connection between the two. And if you kept them separate through the growing season, you would be able to watch which ones had better vigor and vitality and better pest and disease resistance. And you're going to see some really nice correlations between seed size and overall vigor and vitality. So, um, yeah, so I took the four, four pounds of Astro arugula. I planted three of those pounds. I grew it out. I picked it three or four times. When I got done picking it, when my next succession was coming in, I let it go to seed. I didn't do anything. I just let it go to seed. When it grew up, flowered, set seed, dried down, I pulled it up, shook it out on a piece of old greenhouse plastic, and planted that seed next to the one pound that I hadn't planted yet. And this was my, this was, this was, I mean, it's not a scientific experiment, but that's what I did. And 
It was so categorical, it wasn't even funny. And you didn't sort yourself? No sort. Just, and there were plants were growing way too close together and all kinds of things that I was doing wrong, but <laughs> they had sorted it, and then what I had gotten from them was the bottom of the barrel, so. <laughs> the, no purpling, no yellowing, no flea beetles, rapid growth, thick leaves, you know, many more pounds per square foot of arugula on my saved seed by all I had to, all I did was just let it be. So until we have a seed company that is actually doing a good job with helping mother plants, I suggest if it's not too much of a hassle, saving your seeds, coordinating with your local friends who are doing it, um, I would, I think it's really important that we save seed from healthy mother plants. And doing tillage and doing NPK fertility, whether that means compost, and, and limestone or urea or, or bone meal, blood meal, when we're creating an environment where the mother plants aren't establishing good gut floras, they aren't physiologically pest and disease, disease resistant, we shouldn't expect them to have healthy, healthy babies. Right? We need to take care of our mother plants of, of, you know, in a profound manner um, if we really want the, all this stuff to be moving forward. So You don't plant any hybrids, uh, you, everything heirloom that you plant? I'm pretty much all heirlooms. Yeah, I've had some great results. I mean, my summer squash, like I talked about, you know, powdery mildew and stuff like that, taking my summer squash out. Um, now I plant my summer squash in the spring and I pick off it until frost. One planting till frost. That's my standard. It's a healthy plant if it gets killed in the frost. Cucumbers are healthy if they get killed in the frost. Tomatoes, if they get killed in the frost. Eggplants, they should not die before the frost, right? Should you die from cancer at age 45 or 50? No. Should your cucumbers die from a flesh-eating fungus at age 35? No, they shouldn't. They should go and, and you know, get killed by the frost at the end of the growing season. That is a symptom of health. That should be a standard. And you're getting those I'm getting those results. It's so exciting. May I ask how long you've been on that land and doing that process? Um, Might be two questions how long has been I've been trying to figure this stuff all out or you know from like from like new new fields to getting these results shortest time frame like when we bought our land we bought 15 acres on one side of the road with a house and a barn and then a couple years ago we bought nine acres on the other side of the road which actually had some land to work with and so I would say definitely by the second year we were getting those kinds of results um, um, yeah on the first year in some of the land I was getting my carrots out competing my weeds Anybody raised carrots? It's a, I weeded a lot of carrots when I was a kid. You're pulling out the forest and leaving the underbrush, right? Right? I mean, turn that thing on its head entirely. It's really exciting what you can do with some of these uh, bacteria and fungal. I, gotta, I didn't have that one on here. All right, cool. We have a total of three minutes left before we break. Yes? My only issue with, and it's not really an issue, I'm trying to be kind of specific how I approach it, but the idea is that like not all genetics are created equal, right? And depending on, I mean, with humans, like different genetic, you know, markers are within different families. Yeah. And, um, and the same would be true with, with plants. And then there are yeah. different diseases, downy mildew with, with cucumbers and things of that nature in our area, when downy mildew hits, if you don't have a downy mildew resistant strain, yeah. you're gonna be in trouble. Yeah. And I get it if the plant is more, um, you know, obviously the strength of the plant is going to determine how impactful that is, but the same would be true with environmental conditions such as, yeah, late blight last year, I agree, you can have, a, but if you grew tomato plants in 2013, and you didn't have late blight in Western North Carolina, I don't know anyone yet. I know some people that went longer than others, yep. but I have not met a single person that didn't have late blight in 2013, unless they were growing defiant or something in which it was resistant. And so I guess for me, it's like, I almost feel like that conversation is, is like almost not being. So a um, couple points, good questions. Genetic markers. I was going to talk about this tomorrow, but um, a genetic marker is a break in the DNA. Is a is a it's a something that's usually correlated with a problem, right? A genetic marker shows a correlation with colon cancer or heart disease. Um, those occur 
you know, when the enzymes aren't present necessary to replicate the DNA properly, which, you know, correlates with mineral deficiencies. I don't have time to explain this whole thing, but my experience is you can breed out, you can select, basically, if given the proper environmental conditions, those markers fix themselves, right? We, a genetic marker for colon cancer is not like the rest of your children's 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 children are all going to have colon cancer. The genetic marker comes from this enzyme not being present when the DNA is replicating itself, and this enzyme has chromium at its core, and it's because you got a chromium deficiency. So you get chromium back into your body, you get a new body every six months, those markers fix themselves. So a lot of the plants we have are weak because of their mother plants and grandmother plants and great-grandmother plants are weak, and they're susceptible. So I suggest we can breed resilience back into a lot of these great old open pollinated varieties which have been selected for flavor and nutrition, and to grow in soil, which has not been jacked up on NP, NP and K. So, you know, if you give me an, an, a, a hybrid summer squash plant, I'm going to have a really hard time getting that to go through the season without crashing. You give me an open pollinated summer squash plant, no problem. My experience is that the hybrids are weaker in a biological system. The hybrids have been selected to do well in an NPK fertility environment, and the hybrids are owned by somebody, so they're doing a better job with the mother plants and giving them nutrition in the first place. The open pollinators don't belong to anybody, so no one's got a real vested interest in them being vigorous. I'm um, not sure if that's, you know, um, a couple points to think about there. But, um, yeah, it's a really interesting conversation. It's a really interesting conversation. Um, I'm sensitive to time, and it's, I might want to eat some lunch, too. One more question. I yeah. started soil remineralization just last growing season. In Columbia, South Carolina, I'm always invaded by the squash vine borer and the squash stink bug on my cucurbits, primarily my squash and zucchinis. I would get them within a month later decimated. Mm -hmm. Just one season of soil remineralization, I was able to grow my season three months longer. I didn't quite make it to frost, but I did a whole lot better and my squash and zucchini vines ran along the ground 12 to 15 feet. So Ever seen squash plants, are. zucchini plants go? They don't, they're just like winter squash. They'll grow and go and go and go and go. You never see them last long enough to actually put on the feet, but they don't, I mean, they're, they just keep going. The issue is not, what do they say about, I mean, Arden Anderson had this best quote, the biggest, the biggest issue is between the ears. If you know what you're doing and you just do all the steps, you can get results in one year, no problem. The issue is understanding what you're doing and actually following through. So, I mean, it's taken me years to get to where I am and I'm trying to shorten that learning curve for other people. We've got a demonstration farm at our local chapter in Connecticut that took the worst spot on this 50 acre organic farms, you know, whole farm and applied principles and in one year, I mean, they've got it all documented on the, on the chapter website page. It was ridiculous, the responses they got in this worst spot in the whole farmer's property through applying a s integrated practices. It's, it's, a, it's a biological system. You have to have all these pieces in place. And if you do get them in place, life, she's got it. She's totally got it. You don't need to worry about it. It's really exciting.